doomsday scenarios are a lot of fun in science fiction. Not so much in reality, which is tough because global catastrophes happen. We don't know what or when the next will be. So how do we survive the next end of the world? Most of life on Earth is wiped out on a pretty regular basis. You probably already know about the Cretaceous Paleogene event, sometimes also called the Cretaceous Tertiary or KT event. It killed the dinosaurs. In that case, we're now pretty sure that a giant asteroid or comet was the culprit, slamming into the Chicxulub Peninsula in modern Mexico. The resulting global firestorms, followed by severe climate change, wiped out up to three quarters of all animal and plant species and signaled the end of the 80 million year long Cretaceous period. We already talked a bit about the inevitability of giant impacts in the future and what we might do to protect ourselves. But impactors are not the only existential threat to life on Earth. There have been at least five mass extinctions over the past 500 million years. We see them written plain as day in the fossil record, especially in the sudden drops in diversity of fossil sea life in deep cores drilled from the ocean floor. Some of these events were probably caused by giant space rocks, but others may have been due to massive bursts of volcanism, leaps in evolution overturning the biosphere's equilibrium, or even nearby exploding stars. The regularity of these events every 100 million years or so tells us that more will come. Some may not be so easy to deal with as an asteroid impact. It's time to ask what we need to do in order to survive the next end of the world. You know what? Finding the answer is a big responsibility, possibly even too big for space-time alone to handle. What we really need is a world-renowned imaginer of possible futures, someone with a physics degree and recent expertise in rescuing humanity from doomsday scenarios. We need Neil Stevenson. Oh, hey Neil. Thanks for miraculously appearing. Good to be here. Okay, Neil, we're trying to save humanity here. By happy coincidence, your recent and frankly quite riveting book, Seven Eves, explores our prospects in the event of horrendous global catastrophe. You know what? You say it in the first line of the book, so it's no spoiler. The moon explodes. The resulting inconveniences have humanity scrambling for survival. Now, you're on record as saying that this particular event isn't necessarily plausible, but would you say there are other threats that we should be concerned about? That is absolutely the case. So the most obvious example would be just a big asteroid uh, coming in and, and striking the Earth uh, on short notice, which would be, could be as destructive or, or even more destructive than what's in my book. In Seven Eves, uh, the, the nature of the disaster is such that the human race gets a couple of years during which to prepare for what is going to come. Uh, but in the case of a, a big asteroid impact or a nearby supernova, uh, it could come with so little warning that we might not have time to do much about it. Okay, so lead time is important. And one of the coolest concepts in Seven Eves is that of the Space Ark, a vessel designed to support potentially many generations of people off planet. Insurance against extinction. This sounds hard. How much lead time would we really need to build this thing, assuming we started right now? Well, I think if, if uh, everyone in the world uh, got involved uh, behind it, that we could do a heck of a lot in a couple of years. In the book that I wrote, in Seven Eves, two years is the span of time that people have in which to do something. And it's sort of not quite enough to, 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 uh, to really do a terrific job of it, but it's enough to put a survivable arc into space. Nice to know we could actually do something that quickly. But as you say, we might not even have that much warning. On the other hand, given that we know that some of these catastrophes will happen eventually, in a way we've already been given the lead time we just don't know what the catastrophe will be or how long we have. So what should we do? You know, in the ideal situation where we could really uh, plan these things out and come up with a totally engineered scheme for ensuring uh, our survival, we'd have to uh, have eggs in a lot of different baskets. Uh, 
We have to, to have some places that were deeply shielded from radiation in case it was, a, a, say, a gamma ray burst. We'd have to have uh, facilities that were off planet in the case of something that, uh, that struck the Earth and so on and so forth. Okay, Neil, the book is great. And on top of today's tips on extinction survival, in general, you're getting us thinking about this extremely important stuff. I think you've secured your place on the ark. Oh, thank if you. If it comes to that. Well, let's hope it doesn't. Thanks for having me on. Bon voyage, Neil. So there we have it. There are diverse threats. Space is trying to kill us. The Earth is trying to kill us. And at the moment, we are trying to kill us. Each threat requires a different approach to survival. Ultimately, our prospects depend on how much warning we have. Let's look at the possible scenarios. Big space rock. This is the biggest threat from space itself. Any asteroid or comet bigger than a few kilometers diameter has the potential to cause extreme climate change and mass extinction. However, we're also in the best shape here. In collaboration with international search programs, NASA's Near Earth Object Program has located 90% of objects larger than one kilometer in diameter that cross Earth's orbit. None are going to hit us anytime soon. That said, smaller rocks can still have a devastating, albeit not species threatening effect. And we need to expand our detection programs to find all of these. And to be really 100% sure about the big ones. Most of the other cataclysms that may have caused previous mass extinctions will probably give us at least some warning and are somewhat easier to see coming than an asteroid. For example, Massive volcanism doesn't just happen. The biggest threat right now is the Yellowstone supervolcano, whose eruption would cause devastation across the United States. But we're monitoring its activity and we know that it's not a current threat, nor would it be an extinction level threat anyway. Anything bigger would be even more monitorable. But then you've got to ask, what about future generations? Do we trust them to keep a constant watch on the heavens, on global volcanic activity and on potential threats from the biosphere? It may be a bit optimistic to assume that our technological progress and vigilance will never be interrupted for the rest of ever. It only takes a couple of lazy generations to miss that big asteroid and then kapow. That's why people like Neil Stevenson and Elon Musk speak against having all our eggs in one basket. If we want to last millions of years, we may need to become interplanetary. Colonies on Mars, Venus, the Moon, and in artificial habitations, space arcs, are excellent insurance against global annihilation. Multiple independent bases for humanity are also powerful safeguards against our own inclination to destroy our own world. But there is one threat that no settlement on any planetary surface or space hotel in the solar system can protect us from. That's an exploding star. A supernova explosion within 30 light years would destroy the ozone layer, leading to a horrible hard ultraviolet bath and the worst sunburn ever. It would ionize the upper atmosphere, resulting in some unfortunate chemistry. For example, a huge amount of smoggy nitrous oxide would blanket the planet, causing a supernova winter. Fortunately, we know for sure that there are no stars ready to go supernova within any dangerous distance. But what about gamma ray bursts? When a very massive star goes supernova, the resulting collapse of the core into a neutron star or black hole can produce these insanely powerful jets of high energy radiation. Powerful enough to do the same damage as a nearby supernova, but from 6,500 light years away. Now, we'd have to be unlucky enough to be in the path of the jet, but it's estimated that this happens once every billion years or so. This is one hypothesis for the mass extinction event that ended the Ordovician period 450 million years ago. There's currently at least one star within the danger zone that could produce a gamma ray burst, and we wouldn't know it was coming until it hit us. No planetary surface or space arc in the solar system would be safe from a supernova or a gamma ray burst. Against these, it seems we have two options if we want really long-term survival for humanity. One, build deep underground arcs 
or better, underground cities and actually keep them occupied permanently because we may not know when the next gamma ray burst is coming. Or two, get the hell out of the solar system and start colonizing the galaxy beyond the 30 light year range of a supernova and beyond the width of a typical gamma ray burst death beam. But interstellar travel is hard. Look, we talk about it here. Is it too hard to be worth it for the sake of some not even quite human anymore descendants millions of years from now? Let me know what you think in the comments. And also be sure to let me know if you have any bright ideas for extinction proofing humanity. Best answers? Get a spot on the arc. See you next time on Space Time. Last week we talked about the spectacular weirdness of the single particle double slit experiments. Let's get to your questions. A fastidious Cuba asks, how can something be fundamentally random? Well, Einstein would say they can't, God, dice, nature, etc. But this is the interpretation of Bohr and is fundamental to the Copenhagen interpretation. That suggests that the wave function is nothing more than a distribution of probabilities and that when the wave function collapses, the properties of the resulting particle are picked randomly from that probability distribution. It's a non-deterministic interpretation. Any deterministic interpretation requires that the wave function conceal what we call hidden variables that may change over time and space according to the wave function, but that at any one instant are real. The issue with these hidden variable ideas is that they require instantaneous communication across the wave function or between entangled particle pairs in order to satisfy experimental results. However, that so-called non-locality may be preferable to the frankly slightly unhinged metaphysicality of the Copenhagen and other non-physical interpretations. VHSJPDFG inquires after the wave functions and interference patterns for massive objects. Well, wave functions for macroscopic objects are incredibly complicated because they're comprised of countless quantum particles. You can define a theoretical wavelength of a macroscopic object's wave function. It's the de Broglie wavelength, and it's very, very small. You could theoretically cause double slit interference with a macroscopic object, but to do so, you need slits whose separation is similar to their de Broglie wavelength. But given that this is a hundred times smaller than the Planck length for anything sort of with a human's mass, getting double slit interference for something truly macroscopic is probably genuinely impossible. Some of you wondered why we didn't talk about what happens when you try to measure which slit the particle went through or talk about quantum erasure. Uh, yeah, we did next week. Oh, sorry, causality. Yeah, we'll get to it next week. Thank you.